Hi everyone and welcome to our spring gardening workshop. Um, today Emma will be taking you through a variety of topics on how to get your spring garden going. Um, she'll be going through composting, companion planting, pests and disease, how to get your garden bed going and getting a good soil mix. So we really hope you take something out of this workshop and I'll let Emma take it from here. So what we're going to look at is how to prepare your garden bed. So if you have never done any gardening before, you've got a grassy patch in your backyard or you've got um, an existing garden bed there that needs a bit of renewing, we're going to go through that. So first of all, if you've got an existing garden bed where you might have done some veggie growing before um, and you're looking to revisit that, you might have um, you know, let it go a little bit fallow and you're wanting to renew that. What you can actually do, and I've actually done that here. So this garden bed, I've been here for about two years now um, in Taramara. And basically I've been building up the soil in this bed. So I like, I tend to follow permaculture principles as much as I can, which is not doing a huge amount of digging. You're relying on the soil and the worms and microorganisms in the soil to actually do that work for you and to create that beautiful soil. So you don't want to disrupt that too much. And basically what I've done here is I've just taken off probably the top uh, five centimetres of mulch, which is you know really dry and brittle, and the previous season's plants have really taken all of the nutrients out of that soil. So I've taken that off, I've popped it in the compost heap, so you don't want to waste anything coming out of the garden. And what I've put in here is a really lovely mix of um, compost, I've put some worm castings. If you have them, don't worry if you don't, just a good quality compost. Now, if you're starting out afresh and you haven't got a compost heap, perfectly fine to buy compost from your nursery or hardware store. That's totally fine. Um, but I would work towards trying to have your own compost because really nothing replaces uh, the compost that you can create at home. So I've just mixed, uh, put a bit of a mix together. I threw some rock minerals in there. Now, I haven't done that previously, but a lot of people have success with doing that because uh, vegetables can be really, really hungry. So the better you prepare your soil right at the beginning, you shouldn't have to add any fertiliser as you move along. So um, vegetables like zucchinis and tomatoes are really, really hungry plants. So you need to have that nutrients in there at the start. So all I've done is I've just um, thrown a really nice mix of, of soil in there. And what I will actually do is for some of my plants, I'll make some rows and I'll put seeds uh, in there and let them grow. For other ones, um, and I'll show you in a little while, some of the seedlings that, that I've been growing that I'll put in. In here, what I'm actually gonna do is probably put some micro greens. Um, if we move the camera a little bit, you can actually see, let me move it around a little bit just to see the beds. You can see here, this is actually really a greens bed. So this is in, gets beautiful morning sun. And then in the afternoon, it goes into shade. So it's actually perfect for, that's perfect there, yep. It's actually perfect for all of your spinaches, lettuces, Asian greens, they just love it in here. Um, and in here, I'm probably gonna put some micro greens and some little salad pickings. And literally they will spring up in the next week and be ready for me to pick probably in three, three four weeks. Um, and then I can keep renewing that. So when it gets really hot in summer, the microgreens will probably die off and I can put some beetroots or something in here. One of the plants that I'd really love to highlight is this one here. And this is a perpetual spinach. Um, you can see a little bit of it there. And when I first started doing my edible gardening, I really loved the fact that for a lot of the annual vegetables you look at, like baby spinach, there are perennial, perennial varieties, which basically means that they're available year round. Now these are a tiny little bit tougher than a baby spinach, but if you pick the leaves, you can see one here, pick the leaves when they're really young, they taste exactly the same. And this just keeps on growing. You don't have to keep growing seedlings. It multiplies and it's a beautiful plant. So again, that's coming back to permaculture where we try and put perennial vegetables in so that you're not having bare space and you're not having to repurchase and, um, and buy plants as we go through. So that's that bed there. So what I will do is I'll put my um, seeds in there and then I'll put um, some of this lovely mulch that I've got here. Once the seedlings come up, I'll just cover them with that and that'll keep them really um, lovely and moist throughout the hot summer. I've also got netting that comes over this bed and that really protects it um, from the insects, which we'll talk a bit about later on. Um, but most of my other beds don't have that on there. So I tend to have to be picking off caterpillar eggs and little things as I go along. 
Um, so that's if we're doing an existing bed. If you're creating a new garden bed, I'm a big believer in what's called sheet mulching. And basically what that is, is it means that you don't have to dig up your grass. So if you're laying down on two grass, that has got that really tough cooch grass, which is really hard to get out. You can actually wet cardboard or newspaper, lay it on top of the grass and then build your garden bed around that. So if you, you can leave it as it is, but if you want to put bricks or stones around it, you can do that. And then you just build your layers on top of that. So we've gone into a little bit more detail in, um, in the handout. And you can just Google sheet mulching and it'll actually tell you how to do it. So I could probably do a whole webinar just on sheet mulching. But that's a beautiful, cheap way, um, you know, to layer it up. So it's a matter of putting your cardboard, your compost, you know, some, uh, some sort of green mulch material and you layer it up until you've got a beautiful sort of lasagna system going on. Put your mulch on top, plant your little seedlings into it and they are fed throughout as, that layers, uh, as the layers start to break down. So that's a really lovely way to do that. Um, if you're filling a garden bed that you've got there already, again, put your mix in there. You probably just need a little bit more than I've, than I've put on here. So what we might do, we might just go and see if there's any questions. Um, hold on to your composting questions till the end, because I know that that was a little bit difficult to hear. So we'll go through that again at the end. So Karen's just going to have a look and look at if we've got any questions there so far. I hope I'm not talking too fast. There's a lot to get through. <laughs> So I'm conscious of um, giving you a really good snapshot. No questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, guys, if you have any questions for this section, please put them through now or you can uh, wait till the end and we'll do a longer. Oh, okay, here we go. How often should I test my soil? Oh, okay, that's a good question. So, um, look, I, we moved here about two years ago and because it's an old 1920s house, um, I was worried that there might be uh, lead or you know, lead in the soil because obviously the paint off the house can go into the soil. Um, and so we got it tested and it was fine. But I wouldn't think, unless you're doing any kind of major works on the site, I wouldn't think that you really need to uh, you know, be testing your soil. If you're talking more about pH, so that what I was talking about there, there's actually um, a soil testing service that only costs $20 and you can actually take soil samples from all different areas of your garden and send those off and they'll tell you what sort of uh, heavy metals you've got in your soil, which is really valuable, especially for edible gardening. So I can put that into the handout as well and let you know. Um, in terms of the pH testing, which is basically, you probably want to do that every time you're renewing your garden bed. So. I must say I don't do it too diligently because I'm lucky I've, I've built up a really nice rich soil with lots of worms going through there. So I know that the castings will be in there. But if you're starting out, <clears throat> you want your pH probably to be around 6, 6.5 for vegetables. I wouldn't get too hung up on that. When you're starting out, um, don't get too worried about testing your soil. If you put that mix in that I've talked about and really have that rich compost um, and some of those other things going in there, that will, that will be just fine. I can see there that there's a question on rock minerals. So yeah, look, any hardware store, um, I won't name names, but you can probably guess the big hardware store. If you go in there, it might be called rock dust or rock minerals. Um, as I said, I'm only using it for the first time this year, but I do have heard from a lot of people that they have a lot of success with using that. Um, and it's really just, some of the hungry plants need a lot of those extra minerals and it just gives them an extra boost. But by no means do you have to have that. If you've got really rich compost or um, even blood and bone or chicken pellet manure from the hardware shop is totally fine. Um, so we've got quite a few questions about netting. So um, what kind of netting would you use and where would we purchase them? Yeah, so look, again, um, I could probably do a whole session just on creating these netted garden beds so I might get Karen just to pull I might just pull the computer back a little bit just so you can see what this garden bed looks like and basically what I've done is I've just um, got PVC pipe from the nursery and you just work out how long you you want that to be and I've actually just got some metal um, metal rebar which is just metal rods I put them in the soil put the tubing over the top and then you do it and stretch it over and this is all purchasable from, um, yeah, as I said, your local hardware store. This is, this is netting 
um, just vegetable garden netting. You've got to be careful you don't get the holes too big because it can actually catch small birds. So make sure you get one that has um, that is for vegetable gardens. Um, but as I said, there's there's a huge amount. I think this is netting is perfect for those sorts of veggies like your brassicas, which like your broccoli and your cabbages, more of those winter veggies where you get lots of those bugs coming in there and your slugs. I'll talk a little bit, bit about pests and diseases at the end because I can see someone else has asked there about slugs. Um, yeah, leafy greens. Look, I think when you're not using chemicals on your garden, you have to kind of accept that you will lose a few of your plants. But um, I've actually got better as I've gone along. I've, I've learned some little techniques. So I'll go through a few of those at the end. Yeah, we might um, yeah. just move on to the next section now. Thanks so much for your questions, guys. And yeah. for those that missed out, we'll try and get to everyone. Yeah, and I can see a few questions there about what to plant. So I'm literally going to talk about that now. Let me just close that. Yeah, question. make sure. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well. So will. now what we're going to talk about is exactly, I couldn't see who made that comment, but we're going to talk about what to plant now. Um, now I won't go through everything. As Karen said, we've got a handout, which has got some great links to what you can plant in a temperate region, which is what Sydney is. So we're very lucky here um, in some areas of, of Sydney you can actually grow bananas and beautiful figs and things like that um, they're more of a long-term goal uh, if you're starting out I would really just start with start small start off with a little patch test it out have some successes rather than really planting a huge amount of um, bits and pieces and then spending all that money and, and really not having a success I think that's something that's probably not going to motivate you to keep growing so my my suggestion would be think about how many people in your family? If you've got kids, what do the kids eat? For example, my kids, um, are, they're not super picky, but since having the garden, you know, I'll find that they wouldn't eat snow peas if I gave them to them on their plate. But since I've been growing them, they go around and eat them off the vine. So it's actually a wonderful process for your kids to learn about that. If you don't have kids, beautiful for your own snack as you're gardening. <laughs> um, so think about how many people in your family, what do you eat? That would be my first thing is plant what you eat. Um, you don't want to plant things and then, you know, plant heaps of beetroot because it's pretty easy to grow, but then do you eat beetroot? So have a think about what you actually plant. Um, for me, the most popular summer veggies in my garden are tomatoes, cucumbers, all the lettuces. So I can do beautiful stir fries. If you're into green smoothies, you can do that. The perpetual spinach again, um, I don't know whether, you might be able to get it from the nurseries, definitely online. Um, it's more of a, in the permaculture groups, we all love um, perpetual spinach, but that's a fantastic one because you can throw it into everything. I'm gonna show you today um, some of the things I'm putting in the ground. Um, so what I've got here is some little tomato plants. So you'll get some tomato seed packs, as Karen said, for free as part of this workshop. So you can pick those up. And what you need to do is plant them in little trays before you actually put them in the ground. So tomatoes are one of those plants that you really need to give them a head start in either just under cover somewhere. You don't have to have a special greenhouse. Um, I actually started these really early. So these are probably maybe six weeks old. Um, and as you can see, I'll hold one up really close because it's a bit tricky to know when to transplant them. So this one's just been transplanted the other weekend and you can see it's got its second set of leaves. So when it comes up with the straight leaves, leave them for a little while, wait till they come up with a second one and then put them into another container. And I'll probably wait till these get maybe about this high till I actually put them in the ground and bury them right deep into the ground. So up just below where the leaf axis is and that'll mean that they put out lots of roots under the ground and they're a much stronger plant. So that's a tip that I found out about last year um, and I've been doing that. So that's tomatoes. Um, some of the more common ones, um, I've got, let's see if I can lift this tray out. So you can see here I'm growing Romanesco zucchini. So this is a bit of an experiment this year. You can see it's absolutely bounding out of that pot. Um, it's, a, it's going to be a huge plant, I think. So that's a beautiful, um, beautiful zucchini. So I'm trying a few different varieties. Um, the basic Black Beauty zucchini is beautiful. I grew that last year and that was really, really successful. So I'll show you how to pop those into the ground and some of the ways that I use to stake them. And then I've got some beautiful leeks growing here. Um, I'll show you one of those. So you can see here. So I'll wait till, and that's grown from seed as well. So you can wait till they get a little bit bigger because they can, they love the sun, but if you put them in the ground and they're too small, they'll just shrivel up and they won't be able to survive. 
So wait till they get a bit of a thicker stem on them. And then I've also got some beautiful beetroot here. So I just put this in, I've got it in this green garden bed and you just pop it into the gaps. So ideally in a garden bed, you don't want to have any bare soil. So um, cover every available bit of bare soil with mulch. Um, I do not weed this garden. So I have no weeds come up um, because I have I've done that sheet mulching. So I've put the sheet mulch of cardboard right at the bottom of the garden bed before I put the soil on. And then I have a really thick layer of mulch and I really don't weed. So I pop my little beetroots in between any gaps and have a constant supply of those. So they're a beautiful veggie to grow and you can do so many things with, with beetroot. Um, so there's some of the things in our handout will give you, as I said, a full list of, of what you can plant. So what I thought I'd do next is just show you um, what I put into a seed raising mix. How are we going for time? At 12.30. Okay. All right. So what we've got here, so it's, it's quite similar. It's a little bit different to the soil that I've prepped my garden bed with because obviously the seeds are really small and as their roots come out, they're very delicate. So you want the soil to be really loose, um, but also retain moisture. So you don't want to have a thick boggy soil because that's just going to rot the seedlings as they come out. Um, so what I do is I've put in here, I've got a, a really nice mix as you can see here. Um, so I think you can't see it. But I'll put a bit of a list of what, what goes into this. So you can buy, again, seed raising mix from the nursery, but you will go through it very quickly. Um, and it's nice to be able to do it yourself. So again, you want to put some of your compost or your worm castings in there. One addition that I do put into the seed raising mix is, it's called Coir, C-O-I-R and they come in blocks. And again, um, if you go into your nursery or garden centre, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And it's basically just a block of coconut fibre and it holds moisture beautifully. So all you do with that is you put it into a bucket, you cover it with water, leave it for 15 minutes and it turns into this beautiful soft uh, material that you mix in with your compost. Um, don't put rock minerals or anything in this because they don't need it, the seedlings don't need fertilizer at this point um, you just want to get them out of the ground so mix that through and that'll give you a beautiful and you can see here it's a really loose friable uh, soil and then you just want to keep it moist so you can use a sprayer you can use a really light watering can but you just want to keep it constantly moist not wet um, so that's how you get your seeds going and you'll get these little pots um, along with your tomato seeds when you go and pick up your goodies and these are great. These are a little bit small. I've used these previously and the seedlings tend to get, you know, much too big for these pretty quickly. So if you can get them a little bit bigger than that. And these can literally, this, the roots will actually pop out the bottom and you can just plant them straight into the soil. So you can see here, once I've got my seedling in here, you just plant it straight into the soil like that and then just cover the edge up and the plant will just keep on growing and the pot will break down. So if you've wondered about how these work, that's how they work. If you're transplanting them, obviously you can just um, shred them up and put them into your compost once you finish with them. Like tomatoes, obviously you have to transplant them again. You don't wanna put them straight into the soil. Um, but yeah, don't get too hung up on all the details. I think the most important thing is just, you know, experiment. Um, you know, not all my plants survive. I'm, I'm not a perfect gardener. I think that's half the fun is just uh, trial and error. So I've also, if you're wondering why I've got this Hessian sack here, I prepared this soil probably about a week ago um, and I've just put the Hessian sack over here just so the worms can do their job and, and break all the soil down nicely for me. So that's another trick someone, um, someone told me because if you have bare soil, Obviously, the, the sun's just going to dry it completely out, and that's not what you want to be putting new seedlings into. All right, so before we move on to trellises and stakes, is there any other, let me see if there's any other little questions yeah, there? Yeah, guys, if you have raising? any questions about that section, um, please just put them through now. Um, just have a look and see. What is the easiest fruit or veg to start with? <laughs> Um, look, probably not fruit, I'd probably, because obviously, um, uh, look, I mean, I'm talking more about fruit trees, I suppose, that for me, that's probably a long term, that's a whole other ball game, growing fruit trees. Fruit on smaller plants, you can, um, look, I actually discovered pepinos last year, P-E-P-I-N-O, and they're like a cross between a tomato and a, 
or sorry, a cross between a rock melon and a cucumber. And they are the easiest thing to grow. You don't do anything to them. You can stake them. They're a little bit tricky to find, but they're really uh, lovely to grow. In terms of vegetables, um, some of those ones I mentioned. So tomatoes, definitely full sun position, throw them in the ground, you know, stake them as they go up, really, really easy. Cucumbers are easy as well, and they have a similar climbing habit. And I'll show you some of the frames you can use for those. Um, carrots I found a little bit trickier. So, you know, you give them a go, but don't be surprised if it takes you a little while to figure out uh, how carrots grow. They're a little bit more of a trickier veggie, surprisingly. Um, but yeah, I, I'd stick with some of those big ones. Zucchinis I found really easy um, and definitely salad greens. Everyone should have a pot at their back door or a garden bed with their greens in there. They're the easiest thing to grow. Um, and once you've, you know, you can just pick off them as they grow. Um, so we've got one question. Can you use chicken manure straight into the soil mix or does it need to compost first? Yeah, so if it's fresh chicken manure, I probably would give it a bit of time just in a compost heap just to get some of that acidity out of it. If you just buy, I think it's called Rooster Booster, you can buy from the shops and it's a great chicken, pelleted chicken manure. And I, I often throw that through my mix. Um, dynamic lifter you can also do, but again, dynamic lift is a little bit strong. So um, just be a bit sparing about how you put that in. Uh, so we've got one more question and then we'll move on. If we're starting from scratch and buying a bag of basic soil from the shops, is there a massive difference between a $3 potting soil and $12 potting soil? Or is it all relatively right. similar? <laughs> yeah, look, good question. Um, I think, so I wouldn't be putting potting soil in here. Obviously, if you're using potting soil, that's in your pot. So Look, a premium potting mix is better simply because it's probably got more um, more of those sort of nutrients in there. And in a pot, obviously, the plant is going to use those minerals really, really quickly. So yes, in potting mix, I probably would go for the better quality one because you're actually probably going to, your plants are going to do better. Um, in terms of compost to go into your garden, I think you can buy a bag for $3.95. As long as you're enriching it with other things, like your rock minerals or your chicken manure, then that's fine. I wouldn't just be putting $3 bags of compost straight into your garden bed and planting into that. I think you do need to enrich it a little bit. Um, I can see a question there about how to prune tomato plants. So I can talk to that, you know, talk about that in a little while. And yes, I'm also going to talk about companion planting, um, which is a beautiful topic and I love companion planting. Um, what else have we got there? Slugs, we saw that. Would you improve the taste of tomatoes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, look, I'm not really sure. I think it would probably be the variety that you plant. I would probably, if you're really passionate about tomatoes and you want to plant a few different varieties, I would look online. Um, that's what I did when I first started and just find out, you know, some tomatoes are better for cooking your passatas, like your Roma tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are kind of an all round winner. Everyone loves cherry tomatoes and they can be used in salads and things. Your bigger beef steak or money maker tomatoes are a little bit harder to grow. Um, I find them a little bit trickier to, to grow. But yeah, in terms of taste, obviously a really fertile soil will help your tomatoes to be, um, to be healthier. But the taste I think would depend on the variety you choose to plant. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. And thank right. you, everyone, for your questions. Great questions, everyone. Yeah. It's wonderful to see everyone so enthusiastic. So what I'm going to do is I might, get, with... might be able to just push the screen up a little bit. Let's yeah. Get rid of the question. I'm having a bit of trouble with the cursor. All right. So I'm just going to move back here. We're just going to look at some of the ways that you can actually Sorry. train your tomatoes and your cucumbers. Can you see that, everyone? Sorry, I'm just having a bit right. of trouble Let's with the cursor. Let's just put it up a little bit like yeah. that. Okay. okay, so what I'm going to show you over here, everyone can see, is I've got two, um, I've got some, that's just broken off there. I've got some very wilted broccoli there because it's very hot here today. Um, so I've got two techniques here, which I can show you. So this is a simple trellis. Um, and what we've got here is, I've just made a trellis out of some stakes here and just put some wire mesh behind it. You can buy trellises ready-made, um, but I do like to try and use things that I have around already. Um, so I've popped this up. I think I'm probably going to trail some beans up here and maybe put um, some cucumbers on the other end. So this is a full sun position. So you want to put things here uh, that love that full sun. 
This one here, I'm actually going to put um, a zucchini on. So I've also got another thicker um, steak here, which I'll just show you. So I'm gonna pop this in the ground. Now, this is an interesting thing I thought I'd share with you is um, that you can actually steak zucchini. So I don't know whether people actually realize that like, Zucchinis tend to grow like a pumpkin. They sprawl all over the ground and grow all over the place. I actually had great success with staking them last year. So I'm gonna use, they are a big plant, so I'm using some really tough stakes this year. And what I'll do is I'll actually just pop this in here. So this is quite a big pot. So I'm just gonna dig quite a decent little hole in here. I can't actually see, but I'm just gonna pop that in there. And then I'm just going to put the soil back around it. And what you'll do, make sure that you've got your plant not too close to the stake, but just close enough that as it grows, oh, sorry. Just we're just coming a little over. bit closer. So you want to just sort of have your leaves so they're just sitting against the stake like this and then let them grow up. Once they get up sort of halfway, you can start using some twine or some simple um, stockings. Make really good ties because you don't want to break the delicate stem. Um, and that will just go in there. Now with a particular thing with the zucchini is you do need to be a little bit vigilant about tying it to the stake because it does grow quite quickly um, and, the st and the stem gets very, very thick. So what you'll actually do is as it grows with each new set of leaves, just put a new tie around. And then what'll actually happen is you'll have a really thick stem coming up here and all your zucchinis will just fan out from the side of the stake. You don't have to do this if you don't have a lot of time in the garden and you've got more space just let them roam. Um, but you'll find that you may have more problems with powdery mildew if they're along the ground because there's not as much air circulation. When you're growing against a stake, it lets the air go through and I find you have much less problems with that. So that's your zucchinis. Um, now, what we might do is we might move on to pests and disease because I'm just conscious of yeah, time. And I know to. some people wanted to know about um, companion planting. So. This is a beautiful topic and I think um, an essential with anyone that's trying to garden without using chemicals. So what I've got here, you can't, we might just move the computer yep. so you can see this beautiful nasturtium back here. So over here, um, we've got a lovely plant growing here and what I've actually done, which is a bit of an accident but it's worked really beautifully, is I've got the nasturtiums growing at the bottom here and then I've got these beautiful snow peas growing up here. I might just pull back a tiny bit. Uh, yeah. um, and you can see that here. So the nasturtium is a perfect companion plant and this one actually um, attracts bees and butterflies so that they can actually pollinate your garden. Um, but it also deters a lot of pests. So some pests don't like the smell of the nasturtium. And the same goes for marigold. So I've popped a little marigold in here, which you probably can't see, it's so tiny. We'll go back over, over to the table. Um, and what you'll find when you're planting companion plants is that it just gives you beautiful variety in the garden. So kind of uh, some gardening techniques, I suppose, you're just planting one whole plant uh, in a garden bed. And what that actually does is create you know, a feast for any butterfly or, or bug that's coming past because they just, you know, see this swathe of broccoli or swathe of lettuce and, and get stuck in. If you break up the bed, you know, maybe you have some beetroot seedlings in there, you put some nasturtiums and marigolds in there. Um, what you'll find is that they will get a bit confused. So they may, you know, uh, avoid your plants. Um, so yeah, as I said, the, the companion plants serve a few different purposes. Um, and we'll have a list of all those companion plants in the handout. But what they do is they, they can actually improve the quality of your soil um, and they will actually attract really good bugs to your garden, which then eat the pests. So I will go into that in a little while, but um, bugs like ladybirds will actually feast on aphids. So if you leave your plants for a little while, if you do get an aphid infestation, if you can be patient, you'll often find that enough ladybirds will come and uh, eat up those aphids. You can also get things called parasitic wasps, which actually, uh, you know, sounds a bit revolting, but they lay their eggs inside caterpillars and then kill the caterpillars. So 
and they're all attracted by these beautiful flowers. So I think if you can let your garden go a little bit, once you put chemicals in there, you're actually killing a lot of those good bugs um, and you're not really improving the diversity of the garden. I'm very passionate about, um, you know, having that living soil with your worms. They're actually breaking down the soil for you. You don't need to dig. The bugs come in, you've got your veggies growing. So it's, it's you know, once you get to that point, um, I would say this garden probably isn't quite there yet, but I'm working towards having that diversity in the garden. Um, there are some things that you should and shouldn't plant next to each other. They said to, you know, help the other one grow. So one of the more common ones is tomato and basil. They're said to really help each other when they're growing together. Um, and there's lots of other things that shouldn't be planted together. So onions and leeks shouldn't be planted with other certain vegetables because they might be competing for nutrients in the soil. So while you may still be able to grow them, they might not grow as well as they could. So we'll put a list of those uh, into the handout. Um, we might have a look at any questions we've got there. Yep, I'll bring that up now. I'm just conscious of leaving a bit of time to talk about the compost again. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, I wasn't aware that you could stake zucchini either, <laughs> but it actually works beautifully because I had the first year I grew zucchini, I had so many problems with powdery mildew um, that I really, you know, didn't know what to do. And so I, I did a bit of Googling and, and saw people have had wonderful success with staking them. So I encourage you to have a look at photos online and you'll see what I mean. You have to be quite vigilant in that as they grow, they do get away from you and then you won't be able to pull them back to, to go up the stake. But if you can keep them in line, it's just such a hassle-free way of growing them. Um, so someone's asked about slugs, how yes. would we manage those, especially yeah. for leafy greens? Yeah, so look, slugs are a tricky one. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I'm always finding slugs in the garden. I think it's when they get to proportions where they're actually taking over, that's where it can be troublesome. Um, as I said, I net this garden, so that actually does pre prevent that. I, if I come out at night, I do find a few slugs trying to get through the net. Um, you can put beer traps out. So that's another one to look at. So all you do is you put a little container of uh, just cheap beer in a little uh, container and the slugs will actually go in there and die. So you can actually do that and that will actually, if you do that, uh, maybe, you know, every couple of days renew the beer, depending on how many slugs you have in there. And that uh, can be quite successful. I must say with my netting um, and picking pretty frequently from the garden, I haven't had a huge amount of problems with slugs. Um, I think you know, keeping it mulched and keeping, you know, maybe not crowding your veggies too much would help with that as well. Um, so I've got one question. If some parts of my garden are sandy or clay, should I remove most of the soil and replace it with better soil? Yeah. I haven't been, I have been adding manure and compost for a few years, but it hasn't improved yeah, much. Yeah, that's a tricky one. So I don't know if we've got anyone else from Taramara or around this area, but it is very clay um, and I, I'm on a bit of bedrock here. So the water does kind of run off. Um, I've got a very clay soil, so I don't actually put my veggies straight in that ground level. I actually have all raised beds because uh, there's only so much you can actually, you know, improve that clay. I think where I'm planting my native garden, I've put gypsum down as well as really good quality compost. And that over time will will break that down. But I think for veggies, I mean, it's better for your back as well. Um, it's easier to renew the soil. If you can even just put a, a low garden bed in, it'll bring your roots up enough so that they won't be going into that soil. Um, I think, I'm just trying to think of the ideal depth. So I think it's around 30 to 35 centimetres is kind of your minimum that you want for a veggie garden. If you're growing carrots, you probably want it to be a little bit deeper because they can get up to 40 centimetres. Um, but yeah, that would be my suggestion is if you're really finding it back-breaking work to get rid of the clay and it's not working, maybe put your edibles into raised garden beds and then stick with a bit of a gypsum compost combination to get the rest of your garden up to speed. All right. Thanks, Emma. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. We might go back yep. to the composting yep. now because I know we had quite a few technical issues there. Yep. Um, and then we can do a short Q&A and, and wrap up from there. All right. So. so what I might do, because it was a bit um, over in that position, I might just bring the composting things over. Yeah. And I'll show you. Okay. Just bear with us a minute and we'll get that started. Okay. All right.
right, so I'll just give you a little quick um, rundown on composting. Um, as I was saying before, there's so many recipes out there for composting and everyone really does have their own uh, version that they like. It depends what is coming out of your kitchen, how much uh, you know, waste you coming, have coming out of your garden will depend on what sort of mix you can have in there. What I tend to do, a good rule of thumb, is you want 50-50 green and brown materials. So some of you might have heard, you know, Costa and others talk about this, but your green waste is your nitrogen waste. So that's all your, your trimmings from your plants, it's your long clippings, it's your waste from your kitchen, so all of your veggie scraps. And then your brown waste is mainly your dry stuff. So it's your leaves, it's straw, it's shredded paper, waste paper. As long as it doesn't have a gloss on it, you don't want to be putting glossy magazine paper into your compost. You can shred up, you know, old letters and, you know, um, flower packets and things like that can all go in. So to start a compost, you want to put 50-50. So just pop some stuff in there and then water and air are the other two. So there's four components. You've got your green waste, your brown waste. You need to spray it, give it a bit of moisture and then aerate it. So every time, every couple of times that you put your food scraps in there, you wanna give it a really good tumble for using a tumble composter. If you're using a, a black bin that sits on the ground, which is probably the most common bin that we see, um, you can buy a little rotating uh, rod. And basically it's like a corkscrew. You put it into the compost and pull it out and that just aerates, it's very easy to do. And I think lack of air is probably one of the biggest reasons that compost fail. Uh, you often end up with that sort of wet, sludgy, smelly compost with attracts the flies. And that's really a compost that's got too much probably veggie scraps in it and not enough of the straw and paper. So it's really just keeping that balance. It's like a worm farm. Um, you know, you just want to keep that. Worm farms obviously won't take the same level of organic waste scraps, but you want to make sure that it's aerated, it's not too wet, it's not too dry, uh, and you should be you know, on the right track. If you find it's too dry and you've got ants crawling in there, you need more of the green waste. So it's just a real balance and after a while you'll get a sense for that. Um, I know we've got a few people in apartments, so there are definitely ways that you can compost in an apartment block. You can encourage your other apartment dwellers to start a compost with you in your backyard. If you can't do that, um, you can have a worm farm and use the worm juice that comes out just to dilute that and put it on your plants. There's also something called a bakashi bin, which some of you might be familiar with, and that's just a little bin that goes under your sink in your kitchen. And it uses uh, like a, a bacterial powder to break the food down. And again, you get a bit of a compost juice from that. So there's a few different ways. You can purchase with a discount all of those items from Compost Revolution, which Karingai Council subscribes to, to give our residents uh, discounts there. So we'll include that in the handouts as well. Um, but yeah, look, compost is really the lifeblood of your garden. I think if you're passionate about growing edibles, uh, you know, and you don't want to see so much waste going off your property, um, it's such an easy thing to do. It just takes a little bit of time. So I'm happy to take any questions on composting. Yeah. It's a bit of a tricky one. So we just got one question. When the compost starts to become sludge, can it be saved? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the dreaded compost sludge. Um, yes, look, I, I, mine is a bit sludgy at the moment and basically what I've done is I've just shredded up a whole lot of old paper, got some pea straw uh, and put that in there and given it a really good tumble and I'll probably do that every day for the next few days. Um, don't add any more food waste or green waste in there until you've got the balance back, uh, back into that sort of equilibrium but Yes, it can definitely be saved. There's probably beautiful nutrients in that sludge. <laughs> um, so we've got one asking, when it comes to composting, is it okay to use large amounts of coffee bean waste? Yes, yep. Yeah, so that's actually a really good point. Um, I've actually just recently chatted to my local coffee shop and I'm going to be getting their coffee grounds. Um, it's like anything. So it's that 50-50 rule again. Coffee is actually considered... Um, a green waste even though it's brown so you don't want to put too much of it in there but it, it makes a beautiful mix you can actually put some in your worm farm the worms love it but obviously you don't want to be giving it giving them just coffee grounds so go a bit easy on that if you've got too many maybe give some to a friend um, but yes definitely include coffee grounds in your compost 
I have a tumbler compost. How long do I let it sit in the compost before I can use yeah. it? Yeah, it's a good question. Tumblers are a bit tricky because obviously you're constantly putting your food waste into it. So when you want to go and take out some compost to use on your garden, you're going to have some of it which won't be broken down. So there's a couple of schools of thought. Um, tumblers are expensive. They're a couple of hundred dollars probably to get a tumbler. So ideally you'd have two and you'd have one going with all your waste um, that you're putting in each day. And then the other one would be turning into beautiful compost. But um, what I tend to do is I have the tumble composter and then I have my black bin. Uh, so I balance between the two. But with the tumbler, often um, what I'll do is I'll give it a really good tumble and there will be sections of the tumbler which will be more broken down than others. So I tend to just scoop out a couple of buckets of that if I need it. Um, the tumbler will always be a bulkier compost than you will get in a black compost bin just simply because it's it's constantly tumbling. So it tends to be in that chunkier version, but it's beautiful if you mix it in with other things, manures and, and other things before you put it into the ground. So yeah, tumbler, just when it gets to that point where you can't actually see the vegetables, it's getting to that black kind of loamy look, that's when it's ready to, to pull out. Is there a minimum size for a compost bin? Um, not really. I mean, the main thing with a compost bin is uh, heat. So that's how it breaks down the waste. So you want to have enough, um, you know, density in the compost to actually heat it up. So the centre of the compost will always be the hottest and that's where it's going to be um, doing the most work. So there are, I'm sure you could probably find some measurement technique, but, um, you know, you could probably just buy the smallest compost bin that you can get and that will be fine. The other technique is just to create a bay, you know, in your garden. And that's where you see people creating some of those compost bays out of pallets. Um, and that's perfect for all your garden waste. I probably wouldn't be putting vegetable scraps into an open bay because that would attract rats and things. I tend to keep the food scraps for my closed compost. Um, but definitely, yeah, there's no set size for a compost heap. Can deceased plants or plants with bugs go into a compost bin? Um, the quick answer is no. Um, I definitely wouldn't be putting um, plants with aphids or with, you know, yellow myrtle rust or anything like that that uh, can spread um, because home compost bins don't tend to heat up to a point where they can kill those sorts of bugs. Same goes for weeds. If you're pulling up cooch grass, for example, don't put it in your compost bin. Well, that's such a quick way to get weeds throughout your vegetable beds. I wouldn't be putting weeds disease plants or anything with bugs on it into your compost bin, I would put those into your landfill bin actually because you don't really want them going to um, green waste at all. Um, so do you have any ways to discourage brush turkeys? <laughs> yes, our friendly brush turkeys. Um, look, yeah, it's a tricky one. They're quite busy at this time of year obviously because they're building nests. I think if you can get them before they start to build the nest, that's probably the trick. Obviously, they're a protected animal. Um, and once they start building a nest, you aren't actually allowed to disturb that because there may be eggs in there. Um, and they tend to be creatures of habit. So if they, you know, I often get them trooping through my garden, but they're not nesting here, which, you know, and they do, they, they eat the bugs, they build, you know, dig up your soil. So they do have some beneficial uh, impacts the brush turkeys but yeah if you see them scratching or starting to build a mound I would put maybe some um, you know some mesh down or uh, someone I, I've mentioned <laughs> mentioned to me they've used roof tiles or something or pavers over that ground they do love loose leaf litter and the backs, back corners of gardens against fences that's kind of their favorite spot but if you can catch them before they start building their mounds that's probably the best thing to do. How do I choose between a compost bin and a worm farm at my house? Is it better to have both? Yeah, I mean, look, I've kind of got everything here because, you know, we work in sustainability and I like to try everything out so that I can give you the best advice. Um, if you're in a house and you've got a big family, um, I would definitely go for a compost bin because your worm farm is just not going to cope with that amount of scraps. So I tend to just keep the worm farm going with a few little scraps and that gives me some lovely castings and worm juice. Um, but definitely the bigger compost, if you're building garden beds um, and you want to be using compost, then yeah, go for the bigger bin. Okay, we're getting close to one o'clock, so we'll answer a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Can you put weeds in compost? 
No, so I quickly mentioned that before. Definitely don't put weeds in your compost heap. That's a quick way to get weeds throughout your edible garden bed. Um, to raise the temperature, hope, uh, hopefully to a commercial yeah. compost level, can I place compost bins directly in the sun? Yeah, so look, I'd probably, you're probably talking about a technique called hot composting. Um, and that's probably something that you probably best to research on your own because there's a lot of different techniques to do that. Um, you wouldn't do hot, hot composting in a compost bin. It's better to do it in a pile because you actually have to build the temperature and create quite a high pile. Your home compost bin probably wouldn't get to the level that you would need um, to kill off weed seeds and things like that. Um, and for meat, you can put little bits of meat, but I wouldn't be putting huge, you know, steak scraps and things in there because it's just not going to break down effectively. Um, so we've got one question. Does staking work with cucumbers as well? Yeah, so I didn't tell you about that, sorry. So you can do it either way. You can use a trellis like I've shown you here because cucumbers have little tendrils and they love to grip onto things. If you're doing it on a stake, you will need to tie it every... Oh, sort of say five centimeters or so you'll have to you'll have to tie it as it goes up but cucumbers are really flexible you can grow them across the top of a shed up a trellis you can stake them definitely but they need to be off the ground um, one quick thing I know I haven't talked much about pests now powdery mildew is one thing that, that does wreak havoc and that's why I think I've talked so much about lifting plants off the ground uh, because powdery mildew is caused by, you know, leaves sitting with water on them and also lack of air circulation. So try and water your plants at ground level. It's not a good idea to get the hose and just sprinkle your garden bed. Um, I think it, and tomatoes hate that. The quickest way to get rotten leaves on a tomato plant is to, is to wet the leaves. So water them at the base and you won't have water sitting on the leaves, which, is, which causes mildew. If it becomes a real problem, you can use a milk water spray so you can look that up again for the recipe but it's basically just 50 50 milk and water and you put that on um, you might need to use it a few times but if it's really bad you need to just take the leaves off um, quickly in terms of caterpillars on things like I've got my broccoli growing here which is probably going to go to seed soon but I'm a bit I get out and I actually pick the caterpillar uh, eggs off the underside of the leaves probably every couple of days because I don't have them netted and that actually works really, really well. But if you don't have the time to do that, uh, you probably need to net things like that to stop your caterpillars. Um, otherwise you can just use a really, you can use the jet on the hose to get your aphids off. Um, and I've had success with things like neem oil, but that's a really last resort because it is, even though it's organic, it's a chemical product. So neem oil is quite good. You just put it in a spray bottle and I've had real uh, good success with zucchinis that have been covered in aphids uh, but you do have to be fairly vigilant so organic gardening um, you have to really love it and get out there and I find it quite meditative just to go out with a cup of tea in the morning and and just check on your plants I think that's the best way if you don't look at your garden beds for a whole week and that's when you're probably going to see those infestations all right yeah okay so we've just hit one o'clock so um we might wrap things up there i know there's quite a few questions still waiting to be answered but unfortunately we couldn't get to all of them but if you do have any questions um feel free to send them through our sustainability mailbox and we'll try and get those answered for you